Good morning and welcome to Society 2045, where we are curating positive visions of the future. Today's guest is Peter Kaminsky. Pete, good morning. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thank you, Ken. Great. So and what we usually you, do is 2045. We usually start out with is asking people to introduce themselves rather than me read some kind of bio, you know, tell us who you are and, you know, something about yourself. Uh, so uh, I, I've lived in the U.S., mostly the Western U.S. Uh, for most of my life. So part of me is U.S. citizen. The way I say it is I like to, I want to help people have good intent, do the things that they think are most important to make the world a better place. That's lovely. It resonates with me very strongly. We're, we're, for those who don't know, Pete and I are friends. We, we talk very, very regularly and see each other on weekly calls. Um, we chose 2045 as a timeline far enough out so that um, we can kind of clear away all the, the, the dross on the horizon right now and, and look at what are the positive trends that you think might be coalescing by 2045 that'll set us up for, um, for a good place that, you know, it, we won't have solved all of our problems, but hey, if these things keep going in this direction, we can actually be in a fairly good spot. What are you seeing um, from your point of view as a software technologist and a human technologist that, that is supporting that? Um, I have to ask you, I, uh, the, one, of the, one of the things that motivates me strongly and keeps me moving and uh, feels really urgent is that I'm not sure that um, it's going to be an easy uh, 20 years or, or 50 years or even 100 years coming up. I want to make sure to stay positive, but I also want to talk about some of the, the negative things that I see happening and having those in opposition. Um, sure. Which, so, we're not looking um, for a Pollyanna view. We're we're want to be realistic, and um, you know we've talked before on some of our other calls about this idea, the Tibetan idea of a bardo, where things are coming into and out of existence very quickly, and so where you put your attention is very important. And what we yeah. want to do is focus on what are the things that are there that we can we can support in growing, and what might be a threat to to those that we can think strategically about, so that we don't get derailed by them. Does that that give a better framing? That helps a lot, yeah. The, yeah. the positive things that I see happening are they're in in a way I feel like they're weak signals. Um, they're where they're you know they're nascent and and largely not formed, um, and it's a little bit hard to hold them hold them in thought and hold, hard to describe them and things like that. So so what I find I guess is that describing it in opposition to existing things uh, is a way to you know say okay less of that existing thing and more of this nascent thing that maybe even I'm having trouble explaining. The big thing for me is scale. Um, the way uh, I have a I have kind of a, a way of thinking about where we've where we've gotten to in 2022. Oh. And uh, a lot of it is uh, humans, humans are an interesting species and, um, and we are who we are because we're social. So we, uh, especially in the US, we have um, kind of, uh, the US has gotten really good at, at individualism and thinking of ourselves as, as a person against the world kind of. And there's opportunity for me to be the, you know, the, the best person I can be maybe there's an opportunity for me to be the president or to be a multi-billionaire, like some of the big, big multi-billionaires, you know, but it's me. It's not about how does our society work and how does, you know, our country work as a whole rather than it's just me. I have kind of a different way of thinking about it um, because, of, because of stuff I've read and, and the way I've, I've thought about things. What I look at when I look at the history of humanity over the past 10 or 20,000 years, it's, it, it gets interesting uh, when humans, not as individuals, but as small societies or bigger societies start interacting, right? And it's pretty easy for me now to think of the bigger conglomerations of humans to be a, a brain in itself, right? Um, like a country has a brain or a church has a brain or a religion has a brain. The, the analogy doesn't quite hold, but the way I see it is these larger social structures become beings unto themselves, more or less. And they have concerns and interests and ways of interacting with the world that aren't, aren't strictly human anymore. They're not, you know, they're not a human thing. So the Catholic Church or feudalism or capitalism or the United States of America is a superhuman thing. It's a uh, um, hyperscale social structure. 
with lots of emergent properties and it's competing with other hyperscale social structures. Uh, one of the weird outcomes of that is that um, a bigger social structure has more mass and capability than the smaller ones. And so something like feudalism rose to prominence and then had a lot of power just because it had accumulated a lot of mass within it, a lot of humans and a lot of resources, um, potatoes or whatever the, the, um, the calories were for that culture. And then that culture, not an individual human so much, but that culture stomped around and wiped out smaller things, smaller and different things and got bigger and bigger. Right. And so, um, so one of the, one of the trends over time is just scale, um, this bigger and bigger and bigger scale. Um, another part of it, uh, especially in the U.S., is around that uh, the, the great man, the theory of, you know, a, a person is the power, um, should have the power. And, and I don't know about everybody in the U.S., but however I grew up, it was like, oh, I could be one of those billionaires that has a lot of power and a lot of say, you know, um, not that that was super attractive to me or anything like that, but that was kind of the message that I got from society as I was growing up. And it was like, oh, of course. Of course, it makes sense that Bill Gates uh, should be, you know, incredibly wealthy. Of course, it makes sense that, you know, the president is is a figurehead that we look at and has, you know, all the power. And I think that's, I think that's a kind of a natural human thing to do. Um, uh, it, it's good to have somebody who's kind of the focus of power um, in a smaller setting, a set of kind of extended family people or a tribe or something like that to have one or two people kind of being the focal point for, you know, what should we do? Where should we go? It, it makes sense to have a focal point for that. The, the problem that we end up with though, is that I think a combination of that great man theory and the growing scale of these hyperscale organizations led to us kind of just going, oh, of course we would have, you know, somebody like uh, Elon Musk being, you know, I, I, the most richest uh, person there is, and he should be able to get to do kind of whatever he wants with that power. That, that, that scale and the, the monocrop, the monoculture way that we do that scale ends up being super problematic uh, because a hyperscale organization, especially if it's individuated and built around a cult of individualism, is going to make weird decisions uh, for us. So, um, as much as you know, I like or dislike Elon Musk and what he thinks about the future. I'm not sure that that he should have so much power in deciding it. Um, same with Mark Zuckerberg or you know any anybody else. The oh. thing I'm super excited about now to come to positive. Um, the thing I'm super excited about is rethinking power structures. Um, and rethinking the way that, uh, the way that we interact. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, I'm, I'm with a, a few hundred uh, uh, humans around the world uh, in Open Global Mind and in the Meta Project. Uh, and um, I run what I'm gonna call a sovereign, a, a, small, um, a small autonomous unit of that. I run a sovereign called uh, Collective Sense Commons. Um, and we've got some other sovereigns in autonomous units in, in the, the Plex, I call it. Um, we're experimenting with how, how groups of people um, uh, form not hyperscale social structures, but small focused autonomous uh, social structures that can do a thing and do it really well um, in concert with other sovereigns. So, um, so in a way that's kind of, it, it deconstructs the, the hierarchical nature of the firm, maybe as Coase put it, um, and reconstitutes it as uh, a bunch of individual groups doing what they believe is right and what they're really good at in concert um, and co in cooperation and maybe in competition with others. Fantastic. <clears throat> so that brings us to, um... Uh, the point of let's talk a little about decentralization and coordination. How does mm -hmm. that actually show up in practical terms for folks? If they wanted to get involved in this, what would they do? Where would they look? How would they approach this? Uh, thanks 
thanks for that question. And uh, one of the one of the tangents I want to I want to strike out on that right away is uh, what I, I, I call it. I think of it as uh, passivity. We've got in our culture. Uh, I, I don't know about other cultures around the world, but I can talk about U.S. culture. In our culture, we've ended up with kind of a learned helplessness. Right. Corporate society. Uh, wants us to do certain things, and it really doesn't want us to do other things. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on on entertainment, actually, um, to keep people busy and distracted from, you know, either the the good things that are going on or the bad things that are going on. I think we've we we kind of inherited a command and control structure over the past 100 or 150 years, where um, you can be a cog in machine, uh, and management is happy with that. Um, we don't want you actually thinking for yourself or, or working on behalf of yourself or working on behalf of a, a small focused team doing something great in the world. And even we have a, we have a lot of friction and, and oddness, weirdity about, um, uh, how we work together in a small team. So we'll have a, uh, condo association, or we'll have a PTA, um, or we'll have a volunteer group that cleans up, uh, you know, a, a creek bed or something like that. We have a lot of weirdness about uh, doing that as doing that in um, doing that in an economy. Um, so we have this fairly strict unwritten rule about life that you can make money if you're working for a big company, but if you're doing good in the world. Money is money gets super weird super fast. So let's just not talk about money. Um, so you can volunteer or you can be an employee. Kind of, um, I there's a there's a big gap in there where there's a bunch of us who are independent consultants or bands of consultants and things like that. But but even those people, it's it's you have to 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 live that life. You have to strike out on your own kind of, and it feels you know like you're bucking bucking the world. You have to worry about weird health insurance and tax and stuff like that. So um, the, the way to, I, I think, uh, so more of this and less of that, less employees and more a, autonomous small groups working on things, cleaning up a creek bed or, um, uh, or working with farmers uh, in their county on soil health and, and better growing practices or things like that, more of that. Um, uh, and the way to the way to find that, the way to do that is to look for look for people who are doing cool stuff and start helping them to do it. Structurally, the way it works uh, is we need, I, I run into people all the time who say, Pete, it's so cool that you started this group that's doing X, Y, Z. Um, I think there should be a group that does, you know, A, B, C, but I don't find any group like that. <laughs> and um, uh, and, I'll and, and what I say is, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, when I started X, Y, Z group, um, it wasn't that somebody anointed me, like the CEO didn't tell me that was an okay thing to do, or you know, some government official didn't tell me what to do. It was like, there's a thing that doesn't exist. And if nobody else is doing it, I'm going to do it. I'll ask a few, few friends to kind of cross check. Um, some of you on this call, actually, does this make sense? Am I crazy? Is somebody else doing this and I should join them? Um, or is this really something that nobody's really doing? And I'll just stand up and start doing it and, and ask people to join yeah. me. This is, this is kind of the part where when I said it's nascent and early and feels weird. There's a bunch of stuff that feels weird about that. You know, how do I, there isn't a thing and nobody's starting it, you know, so what, now what do I do? And, you know, the answer I have for people is, you, you, you know, congratulations, you found a thing that you need to start. Um, where do I find, you know, people doing cool stuff, interesting stuff? Um, we have a few tools uh, and people and groups in, in the Plex uh, the, the few hundred people that I, I work with around the web, um, that, that have some tools and, and a start on that, but you kind of have to know one of us to even learn about the tool to get, you know, into the, the network of people doing that, that stuff together. So it's hard right now, but it is. Yeah. It's, it's Thanks. I, 
I have a follow-up question, but first, um, there's a there's something from the chat that says, is there a name for what Pete is describing around earning as an employee or as a volunteer? Is there a term for that? It sounds like surf to me, but I want to know what your thoughts are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll take surf. I, I don't have big thoughts on that. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, and it, it reminds me actually, there's um, structurally, I, I, I end up having a little bit less pressure on, on um, being either an employee right now or, or, you know, figuring out how to be a consultant that's making enough money to feed clothes and house. Oh. I get to be a little bit more um, I'm, I, I, I don't concentrate it on as much, uh, in the past year or so as I, as I, I might. So, but it's, it's difficult to go, you know, I have a, a choice between, um, either I can be doing this good work that seems like my calling or, or I guess I'm going to have to quit and find a job, you know, um, uh, it's a, it's a tough choice. And I heard myself recently say something like we we got into this conversation about oh we need a new sovereign the sovereign should be doing this and yada yada and somebody said but pete how would how would i make money doing you know and uh, and i i i heard myself say well let's put aside <clears throat> the compensation part <laughs> for now <clears throat> <clears throat> and and we'll talk about the abstract parts of it the the other or the more concrete parts of it or the less less uh and you know it's a it's a difficult thing right now it's a very difficult thing. I've been struggling with it for, for years for myself. And um, I'm noticing a tension in the work that I do. I, I do a lot of facilitation for sometimes for large companies and um, big companies are understanding now that um, they need to decentralize. They need to drive, uh, using the pr principle of subsidiary, drive the ability to act um, coherently, locally in the moment down to the lowest level, but that means surrendering control. And so they're all about self-organizing. And I think there's tremendous dynamic tension there because they have to give up control and yet they don't want to give up control and they realize they have to. And how do you train people to, to do that? And then, so there's all this, we're going to talk about purpose and vision and you do align your personal purpose, your personal vision with that of the company. And that creates a whole different tension. And so I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, on how that mass is moving through the, the system here. That's a great question. Um, and I, for, for most of the organizations, it's, I, it's a, a bridge too far kind of, it's gonna be really hard for them because it, it requires recasting what you think of the organization as being, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that span of control and you know, big budgets and things like that, it's just kind of, uh, it's, it's a toxic concentration. It's this, you know, scale that doesn't break down well. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think what we'll see uh, is not organizations restructuring themselves into decentral decentralization, but rather we'll see new forms of organization. Uh, collecting decentralized groups working on stuff. Um, and, and even right now, I've, I'm in this, in this in-between place where a lot of the work is in decentralized sovereigns that aren't making money. A few of my sovereigns um, are working for um, not big companies right now, but, but smaller, you know, smaller organizations that make, it makes sense to. So we're making a little bit of, I'm making a little bit of money through my, some of my sovereigns working for old style kind of hierarchical organizations. Um, but I, I think it's, it reminds me of um, Clay, Clay Christensen's uh, Innovator's Dilemma, where mm -hmm. what we saw were the, the big firms, the, the, the short story of uh, Innovator's Dilemma, and uh, he did case study after case study in lots of different industries. You end up with these, the big established organizations are too kind of addicted to their cash flow to be able to do the innovation things. So innovation happened in their labs, but uh, there was an allergy for the big organization to actually follow the innovation because it didn't make sense for their cash flow. Perfect business sense. So he said, if you're a rational business, you would never adopt, um, adopt those innovations. 
But what happens is the innovations are on a different uh, innovation curve. They go move faster and um, and stuff. It wasn't it it wasn't what anybody wanted, but structurally, what happened is the innovations ended up in little startups, and then the startups would grow fast and and eat the markets of uh, the incumbents. And I think it's not uh, it, it won't be exactly that, but I think that's what we'll see happen. Um, if I'm a a big smart organization right now, um, and you know, it, it comes down a lot to identity. Um, uh, if I were Google, for instance, uh, it would feel really weird to think, you know, in 100, 100 years, maybe even by 2045, um, there's going to be something that competes with me that, um, you know, is, is Google scaled, but is completely decentralized. Um, and then what does, you know, what does the identity of Google mean in that case? How, how, how do I jump onto, how do I surf the wave over to having an identity of Google still, um, but also turning into this explosion of, of little cooperating and, and competing and, and um, coordinating uh, sovereigns? The, for, for OGM and for the Meta Project, um, where that has gone actually, and I, I don't want to say that OGM and Meta Project will be Google scale, um, although maybe by 2045. Um, but the way that we talk about it, the way I talk about it is as a hashtag. Uh, so I think, um, so if I were advised Google, what I would say is you want a hashtag, maybe it's Google, maybe it's something a little bit longer, um, but uh, you want your sovereigns saying, yeah, I'm part of this movement. Um, the, the, the exemplar for me of a hashtag movement is uh, Black Lives Matter. So um, a lot of people are part of uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, but there isn't a big centralized organization that they belong to. So I, I, I've said, um, and, and I, I think some people think it's a good idea. Some people think it's a good idea, definitely. Um, some people are still wondering. Um, Global Mind seems to me to be a hashtag. Um, so you don't necessarily want an organization called Open Global Mind, but you do want a bunch of uh, coordinating sovereigns mm -hmm. to have hashtag open global line. Same thing with uh, Meta Project. I want to take us in a slightly different direction. It's still related. Um, it seems to me that, um, and this is something I know you like to talk about, um, <laughs> we have awarded control of the commons to certain um, entities, large entities, you know, uh, mining and minerals, right? Uh, they go to the mining and mineral companies. And so, uh, and it's very clear that the commons is, is being degraded at a rapid rate to the point where we're, we're actually endangering our existence. So um, how do you, what do you see occurring with this idea of sovereigns, um, sovereign individuals and small groups at scale to steward the commons? There's an intermediate between uh, the mining companies and the mining concerns are essentially have control of the commons of you know the resource mined resources. The intermediate was that government held um, the the commons um, uh, nominally in in name of and and with proportional votes for from the citizenry. So theoretically, you know, when I grew up, I, this is what I believed. I believe that uh, Bureau of Land Management or whoever. Uh, you know, was was uh, um, uh, was representing the beliefs and the desires of the citizenry. Um, I think that was. Now I think, looking back, I think that was a little naive at the time. Although that was the you know that was the advertised that was what was on the label on the tin. Um, so. So there's an, I think. You know the, the the people on this call and the people listening to this call at least have a model for um, for representative stewardship of commons, um, and maybe maybe that's that's a more of kind of thing. 
um, I, it's a little bit of a conundrum for me uh, because I've been working real hard and uh, I've, I've had a, a focus actually. I, I work with uh, small groups um, and uh, I've, I've had colleagues who um, do the social structures at, at scale. And I'm, that's kind of where I fade out. I don't do scaled human structures, I do small ones. Um, so um, uh, it's a bit of a conundrum for me thinking, okay, we need to steward, you know, air, we need to steward uh, soil, we need to steward um, maybe something like social justice. Uh, I think the way it works is a bunch of small sovereigns, um, you know, a thousand, 10,000 sized groups of individuals. Um, uh, and and this I I the the best thing I've got so far is hierarchy. Actually, uh, you have some uh, another sovereign that is composed of representation. I don't want to say representatives, but representation for many other sovereigns. And maybe you need a couple levels of that hierarchy. Um, but uh, by twenty forty five, I would love to see. I don't think it's going to happen by then. I would love to see. Um, the uh, you know water concerns um, being uh, stewarded by by a sovereign, not by a government, not and not by uh, you know a water consortium, but uh, or water ex, uh, somebody doing ex extractive water stuff, uh, consortium of people interested in that resource uh, and and preserving it for humanity rather than for a few. Great, thanks. I'm going to open up to the questions in a minute for the audience, but um, there's there's one thing in our back and forth about what you'd like to be interviewed on that really caught my eye, and you 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 talk about harvesting and composting knowledge. Now I'm pretty familiar with harvesting knowledge, but tell me about composting knowledge. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where I picked that that terminology up. I think it's not mine, and it, it maybe Jordan Sukut's actually from the Matter Project, but uh, there are a few of us. Um, a few of us are working on, um, uh, many of us are working on organizing knowledge and, and, and coordinating collaborative knowledge together and things like that. Um, harvesting and composting knowledge comes out of uh, a practice that we really desire to have happening and we're starting to do it a little bit and we're getting a little bit better and a little bit better. Uh, calls, especially like these Zoom calls, um, uh, we've got some calls where that we cycle through an amazing amount of knowledge and interest and information. And if we're not careful, uh, it ends up in the Zoom chat actually. And then the Zoom chat is ephemeral and it disappears uh, at the end of the call. So we've gotten better at recording the calls and, and, and saving the Zoom chats. Um, so that's harvesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Composting uh, for me is is taking kind of the the raw silage uh, that we've got um, and then kind of mixing it up um, and uh, and making it richer. Just flash when you're talking about Zoom chats. Um, you know, I've run a lot of world cafes. I'm always struck by how much information is lost. People write on the table cost and they just get it thrown out. And it's like, but there's an amazing amount of richness there. So. I've actually gone into the practice uh, when time allows of having people cut them out so that you don't have to keep turning your head and put them up on the yeah. wall and say, now, what do you see here? Just look at this, make your own art gallery. And it's incredible what um, then gets reflected back in the group that we didn't hear in the verbal conversations, because if you can build an hour into your time for that, um, it, it really deepens everybody's sense of what's been talked about. And it, I think it greatly enlarges the field of knowledge because, um, you know, we have this idea that we say a word, everybody understands what we're talking about. And if you ask people, what does that mean to you? You get a really big word cloud that most of us had just a little, you know, piece of. So um, I love this idea of, of reflecting back, you know, my uh, trying to, to help pay, tap group genius requires seeing things from multiple perspectives. And yes. um, so I really love this, this idea. Uh, we've got, there's been a Pretty steady uh, chat. Thank you, Jerry, for doing Pete's job of um, going out on the web and getting links to everything he's saying and posting them there. This is what Pete usually does in our OGM calls. Um, 
Who has a question? Who'd like to talk to Pete? Pete, I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, the structure of these uh, sovereigns. Um, can you describe them in a little bit more uh, detail? So one of one of the one of the core things is the sovereign has uh, agency um, over you know what it does, what it what it focuses on. Um, I think another one is that um, if I'm thinking about a lot of sovereigns, uh, uh, I I don't care about the governance structure inside the sovereign. What I care about is that uh, from outside the sovereign, um, I can. Uh, I can communicate with them and uh, make informal or form more formal agreements with them, and they, you know, they honor their commitments. Um, so, I think um, I think it's important that the sovereigns get to decide how to govern themselves, um, and that they have a, a lot of autonomy um, and interconnectedness, uh, but not. Um, uh, earlier call today, somebody said I, I was I was describing how you might take uh, or compare uh, like a 500 company with departments um, and uh, including a mapping department was the one that we were talking about and something that's similar but different, which is a bunch of sovereigns where there's a mapping sovereign um, uh, that. Um, you know that that handles mapping for that organization and maybe for other organizations. So he said, so they're not accountable. Um, and I knew what he meant. Uh, you know, the, the mapping sovereign isn't accountable to the larger organization in the same way that the mapping department is accountable. Um, but it's not that they're not accountable. It's that um, that they're that they have agency around their accountability. Uh, so, um, a department of company, uh, the CEO and the board, and maybe the HR department are, are involved in in deciding whether or not you get paid and whether or not you have an employment contract with them. Um, a sovereign is different. Um, you may get paid uh, as part of the sovereign, but you can't, uh, you know, you can't say, "Well, I'm going to disband that sovereign," um, and um, uh, I don't know. I kind of wandered all over the place there. <laughs> you you kind of did, but that's good. Uh, so let me ask maybe some more specific questions. So um, somebody founds a, a one, a, a sovereign, and other people get to join. How do I join? Who decides if I can join or cannot join? The sovereign. That's an and, easy one. And the sovereign is who? Um, this, the sovereign who is, is whoever, you know, whoever the sovereign says it is, right? Um, so uh, there's, there's an interesting comparison here with, with DAOs too. Um, and um, uh, it's interesting thinking about DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, and there's some, when I say sovereign, there's some re relationship to when other people say DAOs, not everybody. Uh, but but um, but to come back to your question, it's an interesting one. Uh, I think there will be sovereigns where they have strict worship rules. Um, maybe even um, uh, when I when I founded you know my first company, I had to to chip in a thousand dollars to have starting capital for the company. Um, uh, you can have that. You can have strict rules about you know um, somebody pays to to join. They they chip into the the um, the funding pool and they get a share and and whatever that would be perfectly fine for sovereign. Um, it's also totally fine to have a sovereign that has very loose and informal, um, more social structure, right? Uh, so right now the the sovereigns that I'm part of um, uh, and proto sovereigns, some of some of the sovereigns I'm in are are still not quite. Um, not quite structured enough to be what I would call a sovereign, but they're on their way there. Um, it's pretty informal, you know. There's um, there's one or two people who are kind of the the you know the the person who gets the most, or the person who does the most um, because they're the most interested in in the project, um, and they have a lot of say, um, and uh, 
kind of the way you join them is you jump in a chat channel and you hang around long enough and you you start attending Zoom calls and at some point you kind of like flip from being um, being an observer to being a participant and and getting part of the consensus decisions. Um, but even then, the consensus decisions aren't aren't necessarily even a vote, you know. So so two two different examples. One is very structured, like a partnership, you know, even maybe down to uh, having a uh, partnership agreement and legal agreements with the state and whatever. And then another one, which is very much more just a fuzzy boundary kind of thing that's, uh, you know, more like an open source project or something like that. And everything in between. And anything in between. The, the <laughs> ones I would, I would really love to see um, that I don't think, I don't know if I would participate in it, but um, uh, in, in a conversation this morning, uh, somebody, somebody said, oh, great, Pete, um, <laughs> you're talking about these sovereigns. We, we, we made an observation, um, Vincent Arena made an observation that of the groups that he's seen, and they've mostly been more on the, de on the centralized mold rather than decentralized. So he's wondering if, he's, he, sees, he sees groups getting a lot of stuff done, even though they're kind of in a centralized mold. Um, so he's wondering, is there overhead because of decentralization? Is that why I see these centralized groups being effective? And I'm like, well, no, I, I don't think that's it. I think it's just, you know, when you start a group nowadays, it's in a centralized mold more. Um, uh, but uh, uh, he was um, making another observation that, um, uh, I, I guess I made the observation into that, that uh, a lot of the groups didn't fail. He's, he saw about 70% of the groups he was tracking um, kind of have evaporated over a year, the course of a year or two, which is not surprising. What he also said is these groups evaporate and then reform. And so it's a different name and maybe a different set of people and maybe a different governance structure that's doing a lot of the same work. But, um, but what I said into that was you get, um, a lot of times you get these, the group either is effective in keeping going or disbands because of one or two people's um, drive in, in making it so, right? So if somebody gets sick or if somebody has got a baby or if, you know, somebody has to get a job, you know, uh, a lot of the energy of the group is bound up in a few, a few people. So somebody said something, Grace Rachmani said something interesting in chat. She said, oh, oh great, Pete. Um, decentralization relies on, yet again, a centralized leader. And um, she said, what would be really cool is if we had some kind of cool multi-sig crypto-based you know, way of having a council of leaders. And so to come back around to what I was, what I was suggesting in that, in that uh, continuing of people from, you know, it's a partnership with a firm rules to it's a very fuzzy organization. One of the interesting ones in the middle for me is um, a, a strictly kind of multi-sig based um, council, leadership council um, that I think we've seen examples of that in culture and in history. Uh, but, uh, but we don't find them very much now and, and, um, they, they sound really cool. <laughs> I've Stuart. got so many more questions, but I'll let Stuart go. Just, uh, uh, I, I have a question, a couple of comments. Um, I love the, the, the notion of learned helplessness. It reminds me of, of Anne Rand, um, saying that if you, if you design something, a society based upon need, you end up with a lot of needy people. That was one of the key things I, I, I took from her of a, a unit becomes its own brain slash its own culture. Um, and, and that reminds me of my, my pickle barrel theory of organizations that, you know, once you're in, you get pickled. And so you can't really start to see that's why new people are so valuable. The, the reference to serfs, I remember concluding that, oh God, we've just recreated a feudal society, except you know the corporation is the king. Um, so here's the question, okay? Pete, when you started, you, 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 you talked a little bit about loving to connect people with, um, and I assume with technology, given that that's kind of a, 
a foundational piece of yours, and maybe that assumption is wrong. But I know that when Microsoft first started to um, uh, uh, market SharePoint as collaboration software, um, you know, they were talking to people like me and like Ken, uh, not Ken specifically, about so how can we help people collaborate um, with these tools? And, and ultimately they didn't do that uh, and I've, I've looked at all of these work group software programs, and I think they're selling connectivity more than collaboration. Do you have any thoughts about, about that? That's an awesome question. Uh, I had a, a wiki company that started around 2002 through 2003, um, and we ran for about 10 years. Um, and we used to sell against SharePoint. Uh, it was the enterprise wiki company. Um, so we were selling collaboration, and you're, you're right, that's a really good observation. SharePoint delivers connectivity, but not collaboration. Um, the, a, a lot of it is actually the, there's, there's a, couple things, a couple things that go on. Um, one of them is, especially in a corporation, you have that learned helplessness. Um, people aren't supposed to, to um, collaborate. Um, there's a, a lot of, um, there's a lot of, the, the company doesn't want you to work together and, and form a brain inside the company. They want to keep you divided so that you're part of their brain, not, not you know, a, a work group size brain. Um, there's also a weird thing where one of the things we, we had to, to help people with was, um, it's funny, it's really hard for me even to imagine this, but um, one, of the, one of the modalities that people had in, in an organization was, I have the answer to everything. You know, I've been working here for 20 years. You have to, my, my job security is basically the fact that I'm indispensable and that you have to come to me to know anything, right? Um, uh, and the, the sell into that from the wiki point of view is, you know, nowadays, especially with information being so abundant, um, the more information you share, the more power you have actually. So that was the, the counter to that. Um, so part of it is essentially learned helplessness or forced helplessness uh, inside a, a corporate environment. They don't want you to collaborate very much. Um, uh, another thing, and, and then I, that extends out to society too. Our society, um, our education is set up on individual um, uh, achievement and not group achievement. So we teach people, which another thing that I can't even imagine, but we teach people that their a grade accrues to them and not and how effective they are at doing everything individually rather than you know your effectiveness as part of a team and the ability to lead a team uh you know form a team and things like that which is the way that i would not even that you should grade kids but you know uh, but you're more successful if you can you can um uh you can recruit people to do the things that you want to do and help them get it done uh, together. So um, another big thing, it turns out, um, and uh, this is a longer discussion for another time, um, it turns out that we have a belief, uh, we've, we've accrued a belief over the past couple hundred years that, um, that knowledge when it's written down um, is the most important kind of knowledge and knowledge written down is the most important way of transmit, transmitting knowledge. We've gotten a little bit better and nowadays uh, you have a search engine you know, that, that says, well, you don't have to go find every piece of knowledge written down. Um, I have a super brain, Google has a super brain, DuckDuckGo has a super brain that kind of knows everything and can help you find the right thing. Um, it's really a weird artifact of, of um, the printing press and uh, the way um, social society and, and educated people um, cooperated, collaborated around the world, that that's all written. Um, it turns out, I'm pretty sure that people, humans, don't exist, uh, most of us, uh, don't exist in a world where we write our thoughts um, and other people read our thoughts, and um, and we have debates in written written stuff. Uh, over you know over 
tens of thousands of years, the way the way humans collaborate, the way humans plan things, the way humans remember things over time is in stories. And spoken, um, uh, spoken and heard uh, in speech, in speech, right? Um, and in songs and things like that. Um, and, uh, and even the way, like if you imagine a, uh, somebody in, in an organization, in a, in a company, um, except for specialization stuff, when you're doing the, the, the act of being um, cooperating with other people to get stuff done, a lot of the communication is the, the, the high order communication, the interesting communication that's not just data. It's kind of gossip. Um, it's chit chat. It's um, running, bumping into each other over the water cooler or knowing that you need to get something done. And that if you go talk to these four or five people in the organization, talk to them, like not send them an email, you go talk to them, you can recruit them to your cause and get them to do stuff. Human culture is oral and um, kind of vernacular. It's not written in academic. And so we thought, I thought, um, uh, there are a few people who have librarian mind, I think of it, um, academic mind, scientific mind. They, they think and write in, in organizational structure, in organized structures, in libraries. You know, I, I personally kind of think in, I, I don't do a lot of it, I guess. Um, I, a lot of my is voices talking to each other in my head or something like that. But um, I'm pretty good at writing down stuff and then finding, you know, other people who've written down stuff. Um, uh, most people, that's not that interesting. So a wiki, um, even wiki is a lot better than SharePoint for, for collaboration. A wiki is a, this library thing that most people don't interact with, um, super well. What they want is what they need is a set of humans around the library. Um, there are humans who need the library, who use the library really well. But most people need a, a layer of those librarians to kind of tell them what's in it and to put stuff in it and remember it for them. So, Susan, yeah, thanks, thanks, Peter. Susan posted. She said, "Can you posted a question? Can you deliver collaboration uh, in the chat?" And and my response to that is uh, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that you can provide some some tools that will point towards collaboration, some tools, some principles, some mindset, um, but collaboration, as Peter just said, is a very human activity. It's, it, it's how we engage with other people and the product of two or three or four or a half dozen minds. You can, and, and people can get better at collaborating um, and the tools for collaboration are much more around process something like World Cafe, for instance, much more around process than digital tools. Digital tools are a superpower for, are, you know, for an organization and for a few individuals, but then um, it really needs to be mediated by human process and, and voice more than, than uh, information as digital. I just want to note we're coming up at the top of the hour here and we do try to end on time. Um, Charles, do you want to Ask a quick question. Uh, hey, thanks. Well, th this quick question may may put us over actually, but it's a rabbit hole. But maybe if there's a quick answer to this, um, I'll try to make the question quickish. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, I guess I was try I was put my hand up before picking up on your your comment, your passing comment about education and something about like individualism versus collaboration, something like that. It's just a theme you, you've been going on now uh, for a little while um, today, but but yeah, as long as I've known you for a couple of years. Anyway, um, so transposing to young people really is where I, I wanted to just flash on, because I know um, a handful of us here also uh, went into this uh, in 2020 in Kiko Lab and in terms of um, um, especially co-learning in contrast to education for young people. And if the part two of it, which is, you know, it's not really fair as a quick question, but the pros and cons of, basically all this stuff you're talking about online, especially collaborative tech and young people. So anything you want to say here uh, as like some closing thoughts, it would be great. 
the my my kids were homeschooled uh, for what it's worth, um, and it had it, its pros and cons. Um, we involved them in a lot of community activities. Uh, so uh, they volunteered with uh, animal centers, uh, different kinds of animal centers, actually a zoo and a wildlife museum and uh, a horse rescue and a, a cat rescue. Um, uh, they were involved with uh, other community stuff, um, you know, uh, that the rec center was organizing, um, dance, dance, of, dance uh, classes and things like that. Um, the, the model of education that I really admire, and I've never participated, I've just admired it from afar, is, um, is uh, Sudbury Valley. Um, and there's a few other th similar things in different parts of the world. But Sudbury, Sudbury Valley uh, is basically a democracy. Um, every person gets a vote. Uh, so there's some staff adults on campus um, and every kid down to the youngest, up, you know, five years old to up to the oldest, everybody gets a vote on community stuff. Um, and there isn't a curriculum. Um, there are adults standing by to help you figure out what to do but most of the kids decide what what they're doing and so um so you get kids going you know i want to build a rocket um uh i i, I want to put on a shakespeare play um i want to you know hang out um down at the swing set and and learn how to swing really well <laughs> um and most of those things are more fun to do with with not just one person, but several people. And of course, if you're a, a kid that likes to be a, a single person reading a book under the tree, that's fine. Um, nobody's going to bother you. Um, or learning how to read under a tree by yourself, that's fine. Or asking an adult or another kid, can you show me what reading is and how that works? Um, you know, I, I see the book, I see these marks, um, and I see people talking, but I don't know how to map them. Maybe you want to do that by yourself. Maybe you want to do that together with somebody else. But the the whole thing was, you know, have a, a place for kids to be kids uh, and to figure out what to do themselves uh, and to organize activities themselves uh, to get to get their the work of learning and growing and being a kid done. So the things that you learn out of that are agency. Um, I like the most important thing that you can teach a kid is agency and deciding, like knowing who you are, what's important to you, and how to talk to about it to other people. So you learn agency and you learn dem dem democracy, democratic voting, decisions on things. You learn how to, uh, you know, join a group. You learn how to form a group, um, and I th I think that makes a lot of sense. And anything else on top of that. Um, I, you know, I, 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 so if we had a bunch of Sudbury schools, I would love to be like, oh, we need a sovereign that does mapping. Um, and I know there's one or two kids that are amazing mappers at, you know, XYZ school. Um, let's go start a sovereign there. You know, that would be great. Um, we, another thing we do too, uh, too much is we, we don't mix ages well. Uh, so my kids growing up when they were homeschooled, um, I remember my one of my daughters, my older daughter, uh, was buddy buddy with, uh, you know, a few people in their 60s and 70s uh, because they were throwing pots together, you know. And you want you, the 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 whole thing with schools and segregated ages and, and even segregating the the segregated ages. It's like super crazy, super insane. Um, so you want kids to be participate, participating in life, you know, and um, the, the best way that you can do that is to have them live. Thanks. Um, this will be a quick question. I was just curious, uh, Peter, like Stuart, I was really enjoying the um, you offering what you offered around learned helplessness. And I was curious if you or anyone has language or a name for um, it's like the idea that learned helplessness is increasing in prevalence um, relative to the growth of what I would call convenience culture, especially as we see it in technology. Does anyone have a name for that? Is there ideas that already exist around that? Uh, I, I would add convenience culture is, is a good thing. I, I would also add entertainment culture. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, an, and I, I love entertainment as much as the next person kind of, um, but we actually have a culture of like, don't work, you know, have, you know, eat, eat all your candy, basically, you know, like, mm -hmm. you're supposed to, we have this multi-billion dollar, you know, industry that's all around, like fantasy, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of weird when you step away and go, okay, so 
as as an individual in the United States, I'm supposed to have my butt on the couch for like four hours a day, just like like uh you know entertainment. You know, it's like what's up with that? You know. Um, anyway, um, love your question. I don't have I don't have more terminology around it. And I wonder if anybody else does. Late stage capitalism, decadence, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just feels like we're, uh, I'll use the term end times actually, with the caveat that end time just means these are the times of the ending. It's not the end of the world. It's just the end of this world. And the new world yeah. is already waiting to be born and already emerging. And um, that's, the, that's the thing that, that people freak out about. They think the end of the world. And it's like, well, it could actually be a good thing. <laughs> I like uh, Jerry's affluenza. In, uh, yes. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Peter. So I really, I've really enjoyed um, everything you've you've said. As as always, I always have a good time hanging out and talking with you. And I'm glad I got a chance to share you with some of my friends. Yeah.